Hello, I'm Barry Daniel, and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated, ethical life, avoiding dogma or any appeal to authority. Our guest today is Jamie Holmes, a former research coordinator at Harvard University in the Department of Economics and a future TENS Fellow at New America. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, The New Yorker, Slate, Politico, The Christian Science Monitor, The New Republic and The Atlantic. And he's here to talk to us today about his new book, Nonsense, The Power of Not Knowing. Hello, Jamie. Welcome to the Middle Way Society podcast. Thank you so much, Barry. Thanks for having me. Okay, well, could you begin, Jamie, by telling us a, a bit about your background and, and what, what was it that prompted you to write the book? Sure. Well, professionally, I used to work at Harvard as a research coordinator uh, in the Department of Economics. So I was interested in science and I was helping run and manage randomized control trials. And I helped run a randomized control trial uh, in India in 2008. And then when I was in Cambridge, I was doing that at, with some local experiments. So I had a strong interest in science. Um, going further back, I had an interest in contradictions and ambiguities really uh, from the time I was very young. I had a very wonderful but bizarre childhood. Uh, when I was 11, my father uh, had a fellowship and he took me to Germany for a year and he threw me, insisted that I go to a German school. I had almost no background in, in, in I had two weeks of Berlitz language training, and then he threw me into school. Wow. And this, this pattern kind of repeated itself. Uh, so Budapest, although that was an American school when I was 15, I grew up on the south side of Chicago, which is a very diverse uh, and rich neighborhood. And, and I did, I grew, mostly I was there. I, I spent two years of high school in Boston, which is uh, not as diverse. So I've always been, and oh, and then I went to the Peace Corps after college, and I was in Romania uh, for a year and a half. So I've always really been interested in what happens when you know a certain worldview or set of expectations collides with an environment which is very different yeah. and challenges that worldview and makes you think of categories in a new way. So that was always something I had always you know, I thought about a lot and was very personal to me. And then I came upon the work of uh, where I had been researching the work of Roy Baumeister, psychologist Roy Baumeister. He was writing about willpower. That led me to this fantastic book uh, by the social psychologist R.E.A. Kruglansky called The Psychology of Closed Mindedness. And I found that there was this whole uh, line of research, rich line of research in the top journals, highly respected, which was kind of in line with my interest and had not really been popularized. So I think it was the combination of my interests and then sort of serendipitously uh, discovering this research, uh, Kruglansky's research on the need for closure. Yeah, well, it's definitely a book that um, um, you've intrigued me to read too. So uh, <laughs> uh, that, I think that, that's soon going to be a book that I'll be reading, Jamie. Anyway, you, It's a great book. You, you say the mind state caused by ambiguity is uncertainty and it's an emotional amplifier in that it makes anxiety more agonising but pleasure also more enjoyable. So we, do we sort of tend to go one way or the other when we get confused, either closing down or opening up? Absolutely. I would phrase it just a slightly different. I would say we tend to go one way or another when we feel uncertain, causing, it to clo causing us to close down or open up. So uncertainty is polarizing the emotion of whatever it is um, that we're encountering. So there are many contexts in which uncertainty is pleasurable, and we can list them. They are uh, music, modern art, we could say crossword puzzles, we could say detective stories, sports, tourism, uh, any, any times we're discovering something, doing something creative, romance. Um, and then there are contexts where the content of the uncertainty is unpleasant. You have a deadline at work, you don't know what decision to make, you're under stress, you have a, a problem, an ache in your knee, the doctor can't tell you exactly what it is, um, you have uncertainty about how much money you're going to have. Um, and of course, romantic uncertainty can also be unpleasant. But if you notice the context where it is pleasant, a lot of those are safer. Ah, right. Yeah. You know, and, and so it's almost as if many of our deepest pleasures come from safe simulations of uncertainty. So like a, doing a jigsaw, for example. Doing a jigsaw, you're safe. There's no, there's no threat there. Reading fiction is, is, allows you to explore other worlds and other strange places. 
from a position of safety. Yeah. OK, well, what, what do you think um, itch for certainty stems from? Is, um, is it is it something that comes from, like, you know, our hundreds of thousand years on, out there on the savannah? Is it adaptive in some way? That's right. And Kruglansky says this is likely a product of natural selection. It, and it's adaptive probably in two ways. The first is we have to be reducing complexity. There's just too much information. There's a psychologist, Jordan Peterson. He says that the need to reduce complexity looms above all other psychological concerns. So just from the standpoint of how complex the world is, we have to be reductionist uh, creatures. The second thing, and this is what Kruglansky emphasized, is that when we have to make choices, you know, let's say I want to go down path A or path B or whatever it is, there has to be some mechanism that is making that choice unpleasant. That is, there has to be something that pushes us towards action, uh, and, and that's the need for closure. It's Otherwise, we would just deliberate forever, and we would never act. So if, if you're in Africa and um, there's a big cat rushing towards you, you're not going to be sat there thinking, is this a leopard or a, or a lion? That's right. You, you better act <laughs> in that circumstance. It's, it wouldn't be adaptive if there wasn't some mechanism to shut off our ability to debate and weigh options. However, you know, in our modern world, this need for closure often gets us into lots of fixes, doesn't it? It does. And, and so what I began to explore in the book is, you know, so we all have this trait, individual trait level of need for closure. Um, and, and if you take the scale that's, uh, that's on my website, that will give you your sort of your, your baseline level. But what makes the need for closure so interesting is that it goes up and down depending on situational factors. So you know, we have our, our baseline level and then it goes up if you're tired. Uh, actually, if you drink alcohol, your need for closure goes up. Um, any stress actually can heighten our individual need for closure. And unfortunately, a high need for closure is associated with a lot of problematic outcomes. Uh, it makes us more likely to trust people within our social circle and less likely to trust people outside of our social circle. It makes us less likely to admit when we're wrong and very unfortunately makes us more likely to stereotype. Yeah. Uh, the stereotypes are, you know, the reduction uh, of ambiguity to a category, except that category is, you know, a person. So it's really, uh, it becomes in, in times of great uncertainty and in times of personal stress as well, this becomes a real challenge uh, in managing the detrimental effects of a high need for closure. And do you think that was very much in play in your recent uh, election in the U.S.? It was. I was making, I made a few presentations before the election and I was making jokes about how nervous I was about, about the election. But yes, that's, that's a consistent finding and you see it, I, you know, I could give you 20 different experiments which show this basic effect that uncertainty leads to a greater affirmation of belief, whatever your beliefs are. It has a polarizing effect on beliefs. Yeah. And in times of great uncertainty, we look for leaders who can provide us that certainty. Now, unfortunately, in times that are changing very quickly, you want a leader to be flexible. So in a way, we're selecting for the exact wrong characteristic uh, for, because you know, you'd want a leader to be able to switch and change and as information come in, change their minds. Uh, so we have a natural preference for, for certainty, even though that may not be what's called for in, in those periods. Yeah, it's, it's often seen as a, a ne negative attribute, isn't it? That, you know, you're a, you're a flip flopper or, or um, we say a U-turner in the UK. No, that's right. And, and of course, you know, that's a, a famous political attack. But if things are changing, you want someone who's not going to be embarrassed to change their mind. So that in, in many circumstances, that's a, a signal of integrity and strength. Yeah. OK. Can you tell us you talked about the hidden A's in the book. Could you elaborate on those a little bit, uh, Jamie? Sure. So this is this is kind of the Swiss Army you know, knife set of how we deal with uh, confusion and ambiguity. And just to set it up, I'll talk about the first two A's, which are not hidden. They come from Jean Piaget, um, assimilation and accommodation. So assimilation is when we extend a concept we already have about how the world works. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Accommodation is when we change the, the way we see the world conceptually. So let's say I see an albino crow and I'm assimilating this to a, a, you know, a category I already have. And I say, oh, it's a dove. Right? It's a dove. A, a, accommodation would be, you know, it doesn't quite look like a dove. Its eyes and feet look pinkish. I think that's an albino crow. 
I didn't know those existed before. So I'm actually adding to my way of, of looking at the world. Now, what makes it so interesting is that, as uh, social psychologist Stephen Hine told me, assimilation is so often incomplete. That is, I may say uh, of the albino crow, that's a dove. But physically, in my mind, in my body, there's still lingering uncertainty. And so one of the interesting questions that I that I explore in the book is what are the spillover effects of this extra uncertainty, the uncertainty that I cannot resolve consciously. The way that psychologists would test this in experiments would be by trying to prime uncertainty in a way that you don't consciously notice it. So they would have uh, experiments where subjects would look at phrases like turn frog, quickly blueberry, juicy sewing, but not quickly enough to recognize those phrases. Yeah. And then they would give very te uh, various, uh, you know, secondary tests to see what the effects were. And there were two main effects. And these are the two main, you know, these are the two hidden A's, which I, which I focus on in the second chapter. One is, which we've touched on briefly, is affirmation. So this extra uncertainty pushes people to affirm their beliefs more ardently, regardless of what those beliefs are. So the spillover effect of uncertainty is as a polarizing effect on beliefs. So in one study, if you had liberals who had a, a pro-immigration view and they were exposed to some kind of uncertainty, they became even more pro-immigration. If you had Republicans who were anti-immigrant, they became even more anti-immigrant. If you had people who believed in God and then were exposed to it, they became more first. Or one of my favorites is they actually could increase people's belief in Darwin's theory of evolution after exposing them to uncertainty relative to the baseline level, if that was perceived as more orderly. Right. Oh, interesting. So, right. So it's not the content of the belief system, but you see this again and again that it, or nationalism goes up. There's a bunch of experiments which show that uncertainty leads to increases in nationalism. OK, that's the first effect. Abstraction is the second. And that is when we become more pattern hungry. It usually happens uh, sooner in, in an experimental setting than uh, affirmation than this belief exaggeration. And so in the, in the experiments, what they would do is they would expose someone to some form of uncertainty. And let's say show them letter strings. Um, and if you felt uncertain, you would recognize more patterns in the letter strings. And there's a whole bunch of experiments which show similar things. Now, in the extreme, both of these effects, affirmation and abstraction, are really dogmatism and paranoia. So that that's the extreme of them. And we're, we're seeing both of those quite prominently in the United States right now. OK, um, well. In connection with this, well, what is the connection, say, with between marriage, divorce and natural disaster? Right. So there's this um, amazing study of what happened in the United States after Hurricane Hugo uh, in 1989, affecting um, South Carolina. And what these researchers found, Pennsylvania State University researcher uh, Catherine Cohen found, along with her, her colleagues, that after um, the hurricane, not only did marriages go up, but there was a spike in divorces and, and birth rates. So what was interesting is why did you see these two trends in the opposite direction simultaneously? And it's again, in my view, although it's hard to, to be sure here because you can't, you know, the standard of evidence you would really like to have is a randomized control trial and you can't randomly assign people to be in an earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> it's not ethical to do that, even if we could predict it. Um, so... Uh, but what it looks to me like is happening here is that this is evidence of the same polarizing effect that we observed. That is, couples who are have uncertain relationships wanting to get out of that uncertain middle split in both directions. Yeah. That is, the divor divorce is a form of certainty, marriage is a form of certainty. And there's a, actually a study by um, a psychologist uh, Sorrentino, and he, they, he measured in couples romantic relationships different people's uncertainty and tolerance. This is, again, a related research thread. And what he found was that men and women who, in general, didn't like uncertainty found trusting their, part their partners a moderate amount more unpleasant than trusting them a lot or a little. So they, they would rather be at the edges. Uh, so I think it's a similar thing where, you know, you have the stress added to uncertainty and it's pushing people either towards marriage or divorce as a way out of, of uncertainty. So... Um... And then also negotiating re requires dealing with ambiguity, doesn't it? How difficult yes. is that, say, in a, in a hostage situation? Well, it's a really interesting situation because you're starting off and you're dealing with, by definition, very ambiguous evidence. 
very, you know, you don't know exactly what the person's intentions are. They may, at different points in the uh, crisis situation, indicate different motivations or belief, you know. So everything is changing. You're getting fragmented information. Uh, the information is very fluid. And so it's already hard to deal with ambiguity. And then you're adding this extra element of threat on top of it. Yeah. Uh, and that is raising the need for closure. So it's it's a situation in which you really need to be able to handle ambiguity calmly, but it's very difficult to handle ambiguity calmly because threat is raising your need for closure. Okay, but the, the book is not only about the importance of tolerating uncertainty, but it also explores how beneficial it, it can be to, to recognize and embrace it. For example, how is Zara's, the, the Spanish fashion house, uh, Zara's business model pr predicated on uncertainty? So what Zara did something very clever, uh, in, in, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't describe it as uh, necessarily embracing uncertainty rather than acknowledging it. Yeah. Uh, so in, in, fa in the fashion industry, the trends that people wear are very unpredictable. So a, a lot of times, you know, you don't exactly know what's going to be hot in a particular season. And what they saw is, what if we design a, you know, a production line and production capacity around producing as few possible garments ahead of time as possible? Let's just wait. So this company, they bind themselves to only 15 to 25 percent of the season's inventory beforehand compared to this data is a few years old compared and everybody's catching up now, but compared with 40 to 60 percent for other retailers. So at the start of a season, they still have the majority of their styles to design. Uh, so instead of trying to predict and then, you know, uh, being wrong, um, they they just wait to produce it and they produce it much faster and they have a much more adaptable production line. So rather, rather than trying to foresee the future, then it's more about reacting to it as quickly as possible. That's exactly right. OK, well, then could you give us an example where actually embracing uh, ambiguities is beneficial, perhaps in a business uh, example? Sure. So there's a, a psychologist at Columbia in the business school named Adam Galinsky. And uh, I'll just stick with stick with fashion lines. So he, he has a great um, study a few years ago where they looked at the de uh, designers at top fashion houses as who is designing the clothes. And they looked at how often those designers had lived uh, abroad. And what they did was they correlated travel abroad with ratings of the creativity of the fashion lines. And what they found is that having lived abroad, having absorbed another culture, other kinds of ideas, you know, uncertainty in a sense, they were more creative. Now, what was really interesting about this study was that Galinsky found a sort of sweet spot for the creativity of these fashion lines. And it, it, he described it under the term of cultural distance. That is, if the cultural distance between where the designers came from originally, where they were, where they grew up and where they were living was too small, you didn't get a creativity effect. That makes sense because you're not getting ideas that are diverse enough. But if it was too far away, then you didn't get the effect either because there was no incentive to internalize that. That is, if I went to Afghanistan, I, you know, I would probably just you know, drink Coca-Cola and stay in my hotel or something. <laughs> so if it's too far away, you don't internal, you know, you're not assimilating yourself into the culture and you don't see these creativity effects. But that's, you know, travel abroad, you know, uh, actually reading fiction. These are instances in which you can cultivate uncertainty and they have these effects on creativity. OK, well, sticking with with creativity, Ed Catmull, the, the president of Pixar and Disney Animation and, and incidentally a life member of of the Middle Way Society, he talks about the relationship between ambiguity and creativity. Uh, could you expand on what he says a little bit about that? Sure. Well, what I really loved uh, about his book, um, and the, the, when I, I make reference to it, is he talks about the importance of seeking out uh, the hidden, quote unquote. And he uses the metaphor of a door uh, behind which is everything that we cannot know. And in his definition to foster a creative culture, we have to be constantly trying to find ways to engage with this and grapple with these things that are behind these doors and oftentimes what is blocking us from these uh, discoveries are our preconceptions. 
And he talks about how it's even more difficult to kind of explore these areas when you're successful, because when you're successful, you think you know the answer. So what I love about uh, uh, Catmull's uh, frame and just in general, the way Pixar obviously approaches creativity is they understand how difficult it is to stay in a place when you're engaged with uncertainty and how necessary that is for true creativity. We talk about the book Creativity Inc., aren't we? And That's right. One of the things that I find interesting about their business model is that even when a, when a, a film is very successful, they still go through a very rigorous appraisal process about what worked and what didn't work. They don't sit on their laurels, do they, at all? No, that's exactly right. They, they, are, they treat successes as if they were failures. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so they don't take the wrong signal, and that's very, very difficult to do. Okay, what do Mobile Money and Alexander Graham Bell have in common? Right. So I, I used to work in uh, international development. The, the, the Mobile Money is... Uh, well, let me begin. Uh, in, in the developing world, in developing countries, it used to be 20 years ago that the way you would transfer money was by hand, especially if you were a, a migrant laborer, you would go into the city and your family would be in the countryside and you would have to travel by bus. Sometimes it was a long bus ride. You didn't have a bank. There's no bank accounts in the rural area. You didn't have a bank anyway. And this was a very long and inefficient uh, way to do things. And the, and the story of mobile money is that somebody figured out, it looks like it was in the Philippines, that they could transfer money remotely using a basic cell phone, right? Not a smartphone and just the text function of a basic cell, cell phone, the SMS function. And what they figured out is you could buy an airtime card. You know, you, this is, uh, these are places where oftentimes you don't have a monthly plan, but you instead have a phone and you buy a card at the local soda shack and, you scratch off the number and there's a code and you, you text that code to your mobile provider and that will give you airtime minutes. So you'll purchase you know 20 minutes of airtime talking time and that's how you would um, reload the minutes on your phone. So somebody figured out that you could take these cards, scratch off the number and actually instead of uploading the minutes to your phone, text that number to your loved one in the countryside. Yeah. Your loved one could then take this code, you're not uploading it, and, you're, and sell that code, that unused code, to the local mark, vendor who's selling the, the cards anyway, minus a small commission, right? So whatever, 10%, and then you give me the cash for whatever the value of that airtime card was. So this became a underground uh, market way of transferring money. Uh, and it was such a brilliant solution, and it hinged on seeing a new use for the SMS function. The SMS function is not just a text function to chat, but the SMS function for a mobile phone can be used to transfer money. It's a wire transfer device. And in fact, the airtime card isn't an airtime card. It's virtual currency. Yeah. So this recognition of a new use for an existing object, which we have a preconception about how it should work. And then companies saw that this was happening organically and they monetized it. And now there's hundreds of of uh, mobile money, money transfer uh, services in the develop all across the developing world um, that you know just for formalized this this discovery. With Bell, um, it really was the same thing in discovering the telephone. That is, they were inventors were racing to improve upon the telegraph, um, and, and in fact, the first patent for the telephone was had was reference to improvements in telegraphy. And they thought that the harmonic telegraph might be a faster way to send telegraph. So you could send maybe, you know, 16 messages along the same wire instead of eight. And inventors were racing to send more and more messages across the same wire because there was a lot of money in it. Uh, and so, again, you know, the initial view and Bell, Bell realized you know, before anyone that this was something unique it, rather than just an improvement on uh, the telegraph machine uh, was that. You know, the harmonic telegraph wasn't its own, wasn't going to be its own thing. And he saw past the conventional use of um, of the telegraph and he saw that it has this other function that it, in fact, could be its own thing. So in both cases, they're finding this obscure uh, kind of neglected function of an existing device, finding a new use for it. And, and a psychologist that I talked to said that almost all inventions follow that basic pattern. And so would you say then this ability, this thinking out of the box or this sort of almost sort of synthetic sort of Venn diagram way of looking at the world is, is a very common characteristic of, of inventors. 
I think so. Yes, I think so. It's, you know, seeing something, wanting to understand it, but also not immediately accepting that it has to be that way. Yeah. And how would you say inventors differ from, say, say specialists and dabblers? Right. So this um, psychologist that I like a lot, uh, uh, Tony McCaffrey, he describes it in uh, that, that inventors really have two traits. The first is a wide horizon. So they're looking everywhere. Uh, a, a lot of inventions are really uh, analogous solutions, which are brought in from other fields. Yeah. Um, so it makes sense that you know, inventors are looking all over the place for ideas and, and really draw inspiration from everywhere. So that's, you know, if they're looking deeply, they're not dabblers. And then they're um, unafraid to kind of see, does it have to work this way? They, they're unafraid to think deeply. So the idea is that inventors think both broadly and deeply and so are able to draw in ideas from other realms and are able to question uh, the existing uh, you know, setup of, of whatever it is they're examining. Do you think trying to cultivate those traits or sensibilities would be a useful thing to do for anyone to arguably uh, be more creative and make better decisions? Absolutely. I, I think that one of the you know things that play in the study I, desc- I described earlier uh, about uh, creative fashion lines is whenever you're exposing yourself to different ways of thinking of things, different categories, different you know, cultures, cuisines, whatever it is, you are kind of adding the uncertainty which will provide your, your fuel um, if it's at the right distance. You know, you don't want to go too far. You don't want it to be too little. But I, I think this is, you know, what he's saying is that this wideness, just as traveling to another country, this wideness in interest um, is one of the sources of creativity. I have to say, in the, the last chapter, Jamie, I was very moved by your account of your experience in Jerusalem with the, the Hand in Hand School and how yeah. they uh, dealt with ambiguity in a, in an extremely positive way. Yeah, that's it's uh, moving. You know, it's even moving for me to think think back on it. Um, you know, a good friend of uh, of my family, his name was um, uh, Amos Alone, and um, it's his daughter that I um, and you know, grandchildren that I profile in the piece. Yeah. And I just thought it, it it's um, what a brave uh, place to position yourself uh, in, a, in a place where there's such a high degree of polarization when it's so hard to straddle these worlds and say, we accept both of these worlds. And just what a beautiful, um, what a beautiful and moral and brave stance. And what was that stance? What 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 are they doing in that school that's different? Well, if, I mean, for me personally, I don't I don't like tribalism. Uh, I don't like when people say wh- whoever it is, this is my group, and uh, you know, like my <laughs> and people outside of my group, I think of in a different way. So I I, I reject that m- mode of thought. Um, so you know, this was a, to me a protest against on both sides that mode of thought. But there's also evidence from psychology to suggest that, uh, well, I should say that in the Hand in Hand School, they, they encourage the students from both sectors of the society in, in, in Israel, these kids to, uh, to work together, but also to, le- to learn each other's languages and come into contact with the different cultures. And you, you, um, you point out in the book that both bilingualism and exposure to other cultures through travel or just through ex- experiencing people from other cultures within within a you know a school environment is very helpful in in m- many diverse ways yeah there there are these this amazing research on you know how bilingualism is an aid to creativity uh, and one of the reasons for that is that many of our preconceptions uh, that we are least likely to notice lay in uh, our language uh, and how we describe things. And there's all kinds of assumptions in our descriptions of of objects that we're not always conscious of. Uh, and so one of the things that bilingualism appears to uh, give people is a sort of a flexibility in in understanding language, which allows them really a greater degree of categorical flexibility almost to see categories as less fixed things uh, and words as less fixed things than, than one normally would. 
No, well, that, that's my own experience. I'm, I've I've lived in, uh, I lived most of my adult life abroad and learnt I learnt two languages, and yeah. it's it's sort of a key to a culture, in many yes. ways. But also, it gives you the ability to actually then reflect back on your own culture as well from a different perspective and helps you to give to give you a wider perspective in a sense. That's right. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. So what can we do in our everyday lives to in just just some practical terms to have a better relationship with ambiguity, Jamie? Sure. So I would probably divide these into uh, maybe sort of defensive and offensive strategies um, in terms of of handling ambiguous choices. Um, you know, the way that psychologists lower people's need for closure in um, decision making context is by saying you're going to is by holding them accountable. You're going to have, they say you're going to have to defend your decision later on. Um, you're going to have to uh, justify it to an expert or your decision is going to have serious consequences. So you better take care. So one of the things when we're trying to um, handle an, a, a decision that involves ambiguity is to just, and this may be completely uh, intuitive, write down the pros and cons uh, and the different consequences of the, of the decision, but also additionally, how much pressure are you under at that particular time? Have you had a stressful week? Are you tired or rushed in that particular moment you're making the decision? Are, is there any other physical, you know, one of the things from the book is even just the slightest physical stress can have these um you know, distorting effects on decision making. So both being very clear about the options and then being very clear about um, how much stress you're under, what is your need for closure at that particular time? Something else that lowers people's need for closure, helps them make better decisions, is reading fiction. Uh, some great research shows that reading fiction, again, because it's safe, it puts you in somebody else's world. Yeah. It makes us, it also makes us more empathetic. Yeah. Um, so fiction versus nonfiction, and this was particularly true for people who are habitual readers uh, of fiction. Multicultural experiences, there's an amazing set of studies that show just having people remember a time they've lived abroad or friends they've met in different cultures or different music they listened to or different culinary experience, you know, different kinds of food they had also lower their need for closure. Uh, and amazingly, those same kinds of interventions led to less stereotyping. So better decisions, less stereotyping, more creativity, all good things. Right, okay. Um, you, you do get the feeling in some ways in modern life that I'm just thinking of recent elections in, in, um, in the States and Brexit and that the, the polarising political situation in Europe in many ways as well, yeah. um, that we, yeah. we, we, we're more, perhaps more prone to, to thinking in, in absolutes. Uh, I, I suppose I'm... Uh, one, reason that I'm asking this is in education how, how well are we actually preparing students to deal with uncertainty yeah it's a difficult question to answer um, but the teachers I spoke to and the literature I've read suggests that we're not doing nearly enough um, there are some realms you know some topics some fields in which you would much more naturally uh, teach students to handle uncertainty and they're all uh, realms of, of, cre of creativity related to creativity. So you can imagine that a creative writing teacher or a film teacher is going to use assignments that really force students to uh, engage with uh, uncertainty, unfamiliar positions, so forth and so on. But there are other realms in which it's j just as important and the teachers are not doing enough. Um, so, you know, some of the techniques that uh, teachers I, I spoke to used are having students argue on on behalf of unfamiliar positions yeah. give, you know helping students fail giving them tasks intentionally that they'll fail at another technique is helping students get used to confusion yeah there's a harvard professor and and he says you know we i want my students to treat confusion as a signal um that it's you know they should pay more attention not not as a not as a, a threat so a lot of this is you know going back to the, the beginning of our discussion when can uncertainty be pleasant? Well, it can be, um, it can be pleasant when it's not threatening. So yeah. teachers can do a lot to help confusion not be some kind of a social stigma or threat. And, you know, one of the interesting things is, a psychologist told me, confusion is actually very similar psychologically to interest. And the psychology of interest looks very similar to the psychology of confusion, except for one is opening up, the other is closing, and what appears to be the differentiary is when people feel threatened. 
Sure. Yeah. Recently, Jamie, I interviewed a very interesting guy called Dan Kahan, who has done this uh, fascinating research on, on closure to an extent. And he was saying that uh, intelligence or education is not necessarily a factor in people actually making more adequate uh, decisions uh, or being open to uncertainty. What seems to be crucial is curiosity. Um, yes. That um, when your ideas are falsified in some way, then you actually find that interesting rather than you feel this dissonance. Now, I asked yeah. him whether that is a, a dispositional thing or, or, or something that can be cultivated, and he said both, basically. Right, That's and that's right. No, it's... Um... One of the things I find interesting about the need for closure, which is the central, central central concept of the book, is it has no relationship to IQ. Yeah. Um, and and I've known a lot of, uh, or not a lot of, I've known some really brilliant people, uh, highly intelligent, highly learned, who are not good at dealing with uncertainty. Um, so it's it's interesting that it's it does appear to be a completely separate um, a trait. Yeah. Okay, but j just coming to the end now, um, Jamie, the, the, the middle way, as we understand it, is the idea that we make better judgments by avoiding fixed or dogmatic beliefs about things, whether those are positive or negative. That then throws us back on experience, so we're left in this sort of messy, uncertain middle. But we think it's arguably in the messy, uncertain middle that we actually start to, to get to grips more adequately with the phenomena that we encounter, whatever they are. Now, how might that relate to what we've been talking about today? I think it's central to everything we've been talking about. Uh, I think it's central to uh, pretty much everything in the book. You know, one of, one of the things I emphasize at the end of the book is we are built this way. We ha and we have to be built psychologically this way. Our minds have to be consistency machines. It has to be difficult for us to dwell on uncertainty you know, in order for us to function. So we, there's no, there's no kind of sweet little fairy tale at the end of this where we get to graduate uh, out of a place where we are reducing people to stereotype, whether those stereotypes are positive or negative, right? We don't get out of this. And it really shows you how difficult it is to stay in uncertainty. Now, what we can do is we can replace negative stereotypes with positive stereotypes. And we could argue are we losing as much information when we have positive stereotypes of people as we are when we have negative? Maybe. I wouldn't see why we wouldn't be. But those are definitely better. We would want those. Yeah. But you don't get out of it. So we want to be in this place. And everything in our biology and psychology is trying to get us out of this place. And it's a constant struggle, but it's a, a valiant and, and I think a moral moral struggle. Yeah. Do you th just on, on that point, do you think... Um, reflective practices such as mindfulness to an extent help in this regard alongside you know like doing things like you know you're talking about question and assumptions critical thinking etc because yeah. like with mindfulness you know in, in a nutshell it's it's enabling you to respond to your experience rather to to react to it so when you've got that dissonant feeling then uh, you've got time to actually unpack that to an extent rather than just sort of being emotionally hijacked yeah, I, I haven't tried any mindfulness techniques, but maybe I should. It sounds interesting. <laughs> OK. OK, well, my last question, Jamie, if people wanted to, to find out more about your work, how would they go about it? Probably the best source is, uh, is my website, jamieholmesbooks.com. Uh, I'm also a fellow, a Future Tense fellow at New America Foundation in Washington, D.C. Uh, so there's uh, some information uh, about me there on that website as well. OK, well, it, it's been great to talk to you today, Jamie. And any, any, for any listeners out there, I, I just thought the book was really a, a great book, full of insights and very entertaining, too. Thank you very much, Barry. It was my pleasure talking to you. You can find out more about Middleway Philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.org.